sign of the success of, the, of this event. We have, uh, so welcome to all our distinguished guests uh, and very distinguished speakers who will follow during this event. Welcome to the Green Business Forum 2013. Today is a kind of a miracle day because it's also the birth day. So it's the coincidence of this uh, event is absolutely perfect, but I don't think it was a coincidence, honestly. I think Michele was uh, planning very well uh, the, the evening of the event. Before starting, uh, uh, I was asked because of uh, the big number of attendees today just to indicate also some uh, security measures. Uh, Green lights, emergency lights are indicated all the way. And uh, eventually, outside, uh, after the reception, the first right, uh, the first door on the right side uh, is uh, the one uh, for any happenings. Uh, thanks, obviously, to the main the sponsors who were. Uh, in the opportunity to create this event, to Kinaps, who is uh, uh, hosting us today. And we are in this place also because Kinaps is one of the companies, a Swedish company with a very, very strong attention to environment, to energy. And so they're very proud of this policy that they provide constantly during the production of the products. I think the time has come uh, to introduce our first speaker today, that is uh, our Michele Othan, President of the EU Chairman. Michele, the floor is yours. Excellencies, authorities, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> today is the first day, so welcome to the EU Organized Green Business Forum. In this world, sustainability is not just taking care of the environment anymore. <coughs> For companies, it's a way of doing business. For families, it's a way of living. It's a lifestyle. So today, both consumers and members of supply chains are carefully paying attention to the way goods are being produced. And so today, it's an internet society where all information is shared. So customers are able to search for information on how companies are producing and delivering their goods. And they are basing their buying decision based on this information more and more. And today, out of the 100 biggest economic entities of the world, 88 are corporations. So it means 41% of the biggest entities in the world are states, and 59% are companies. Walmart has 2 million employees, more than 2 million employees. The revenue of Walmart uh, exceeds the respective GDP of 174 countries. And they have, uh, it's bigger than the GDP of Sweden, Saudi Arabia, or Venezuela. Business became global, while the state are still national. So next to governments, we have now these new players, companies that can make change. They should. And contrary to states, which cannot have a global reach, companies have global reach. They go over borders, they act everywhere. That's why we need companies and governments working together. And environment and sustainability is one of the most important issues that we have to work together. No, you can decide putting together companies interested in a better business environment. It's active in three main fields. Ethical development, entrepreneurship <coughs> development, Europe needs 
familia, the new companies, at least in America, in Asia. We don't have new companies, we do not have global players in Europe. Last time I mentioned already that the Yucham was selected to chair the advisory board of young entrepreneurs of all Europe. And the third is Green Standards. We have a revolutionary platform, Green Wheel, that will be launched very soon. It will be launched worldwide. We, Yucham, will create and give us a gift, uh, Green Wheel, to the world for free green policies, free green manuals, for operations for every company, every institution, public and private, and association in the world. It will be replicated across all the countries in the world by board of stakeholders in every country, translating their own language, languages, and redistributed across organizations. We are uh, presenting next month, which I'm invited to Cambridge, uh, to Cambridge, UK, the International Sustainability Conference, and we uh, will be introduced. So many thanks to the Republic of Kosovo, the embassies of India and Denmark, so to not name the most important speaker today, and all others, organizations, chambers, companies, and institutions that are backing the Green Business Forum. Special thanks to the European Commission, and to Mr. Potocznik, the EU Commissioner of, for Environment, who unfortunately cannot be here with us today, but uh, on Friday registered, recorded a video message for us. And we will see it soon. Next year, the CEE, Central European Green Business Forum, will take place next year in April. In Budapest, we're expecting between 400 and 500 people next year, so we start working now for next year. I will close the opening words with just one quote. Maybe you heard it already many times. The biggest threat to our planet is the belief that somebody else will take care of. Thank you. Out of my floor, by producing the next uh, speaker, who is uh, on virtual basis because, as it was mentioned, uh, unfortunately couldn't be present with us today, but uh, sent a video message prepared for this occasion. So, Mr. Janes Potocni, the European Commissioner for the Environment, uh, is going to send his video message now. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to have the opportunity to share some thoughts with you on these very important topics. I regret that I cannot be with you in person. Much of our future well-being depends on the business community. Your ability to understand the challenges of the future determines strategic choices today. Your innovation priorities determine what technologies we use. Your product design choices determine the futures of our product. It much depends on us, also policymakers, too. We must create the right framework conditions to make sustainability worthwhile, not only from an ethical, but also from a profitability point of view. The first step has already been taken. Most businesses have already realized that thinking green is increasingly about future competitiveness and making the most of new growth opportunities. Partially, this is due to the success of European Union companies on the global market of eco-industries and services. This is a success story for both policymakers and businesses. Policymakers in Europe set goals for a clean and healthy environment for their citizens. Businesses took up the challenge and created clean technologies that are now used worldwide to abate pollution use resources more efficiently, generate renewable electricity, manage waste, and recycle it. The market share of European Union companies ranges between 30 and 50% in global markets worth more than a trillion euros. 
Eco industries provide 3.4 million jobs in Europe. Despite the economic crisis, this sector has grown 3% per year in recent years and will continue to offer significant new employment possibilities in the coming years. There's a world of opportunities beyond eco industries, cost savings and increased competitiveness as well as new ways of looking at our business models that generate added value. This is enhanced by the failure of the old growth recipe based on cheap and free resources. Material costs represent 40% on average of the costs of manufacturing. It is no wonder that we see the opportunity for European industry to improve its annual turnover by 3 to 8% by using their resources more efficiently. Research indicates that efficiency improvement could meet 13 to 29% of resource demand. In a world of resource scarcity, this can simply not be ignored. There are innovative concepts that can open up even more opportunities. One of these is circular economy, which could become a model to enhance the competitiveness of the wider economy. The circular economy revolves around maximizing the added value in the economy, that is repair, reuse, remanufacture, recycle. The potential is surprising. For example, remanufacturing, refurbishing a used product to an as good as new state could generate 210,000 euros net material cost savings for each million euros of mobile phone sales. Modeling this on several sectors, as indicated in the study published by the Alan MacArthur Foundation in 2012, named towards the circular economy would lead to savings equal to 490 billion euros per year. Through the roadmap to a resource efficient Europe, we are working on creating the conditions to facilitate these opportunities. Let's work together on this area where environmental goals and business objectives meet. I wish you productive and interesting discussions, and I'm, of course, looking forward to hearing the results. Thank you very much, Mr. Potocini. And uh, now we go back to real people in this room. <laughs> and let me introduce you, Mr. Juan Schlaku, Executive Director of Kosovo Foundation for Open Society. This organization was created by George Soros and operates in different uh, fields like right of minorities, civil participation, European integration, governance, minorities, and sustainability. Schlaku, I hand over. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the US is the US is it's, uh, came, came today in the form of green, green businesses uh, to discuss the sustainable development or how to embrace sustainability. Uh, and this forum couldn't have a better title, I think. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Sorry. So, and, and this forum uh, couldn't have a better title, I said. Uh, it broke the most important environmental concepts uh, along uh, the green as a concept and sustainability as the other very important concept. And as we know, uh, green businesses seem to involve both environmental and social problems and instead of maybe causing them. And in, in addition, the green business is about principles. Uh, and then furthermore, the policies practices that improve the quality of life for the customers, for the employees, for the communities, and for the environment. And we can say today that creating more green businesses has become a core part of some politician economic plan. And uh, that's good, because green businesses <laughs> Yeah, now it's better. Uh, so uh, I said that 
it's good that some politicians are more and more adapting green businesses in their planning and, and uh, uh, because the green businesses for sure uh, I mean brings a lot of the environmental responsibility and the green has become uh, a business tool today but uh, when we get to the sustainability then we will see that it became in the last four or five decades uh, um, um, the, the leading slogan uh, among the many environmental debaters, uh, among the economic planners, and as well as the public and the corporate public decision makers. Uh, however, and the concept, I mean, just to refresh our, 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 our memory, was brought by the Brook, Brookland Commission in 1987 and such. And, but still today, uh, the real meaning of this concept uh, of sustainability is unclear even to those uh, who are using it very often. And uh, just again to refresh our minds, it says that sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. And this definition clearly can be divided into pieces, uh, into say, different types. And the social scientific part of it and the ecological part of this definition. And as such, the definition of Brutland Commission is belong to the social or social scientific uh, and not the ecological one. Because it treats uh, sustainability uh, as a relation between the present and future welfare of the persons. So the ecological definition would explicitly require protection of the ecological processes and as a condition of sustainability. And clearly some argues that the sustainability <coughs> becomes a problem of how to sustain the economic function of environment. So that's the, the real meaning. Rather than how to sustain the environment. And the two words within the sustainable development in a strict sense of it are pretty much contradictory. So sustainability implies elements of the long-term renewal, of the maintenance, of the recycling, and of the minimal exploitation or extraction of the minerals. However, development can be interpreted uh, according to the present industrial, the present industrial culture, very much as a short-term planning. I mean, as a minimal maintenance and as a maximal exploitation or extraction of the minerals. And there are even some more passionate interpretation of the sustainability as a, as a concept. The one that I found from a green web is the concept of sustainable development is an ideological cover or legitimization for greatly expanded economic growth, hence expand or accelerated environmental destruction. So in all this situation, I mean, I thought that <coughs> not for the sake of history, I'm, I'm coming from Balkans, and uh, of course we are always, I mean, going back to the history whenever we have a speech even on the environment, but much more for the sake of the situation that uh, very often we will see that the countries uh, is, is uh, very difficult to differ uh, to what concept or what environmental paradigm they belong to. Uh, and fin finally, I mean, we see today that we will have a kind of the triple position of the many countries. Triple meaning that sometime the countries will have an excellent, let me say, legislation and the uh, uh, policy papers. But uh, in fact, uh, the things that, that they are really doing are far from uh, being part of the paradigm, uh, let's say advanced environmental paradigms as such. So, uh, and I, I wanted just to bring you uh, several uh, environmental paradigms in order to better understand uh, how we, we position our countries and, and the people uh, who are uh, dealing in everyday basis, even with environmental things. I mean, and and we can track really the real evolution of, of the environmental concerns over the last four to five decades uh, by watching it uh, as uh, somebody from OECD, uh, from uh, one of the OECDs. Uh, OECD workshop said, watching how the environmental concerns are moving 
um, the back pages of the, of the main newspapers to the front page and now more and more to the financial pages. So this, this will describe a lot of the, uh, the position of the uh, environmental paradigmas uh, which are floating sometimes or shifting from one to, to, the, to, to another one. So the general perception, I would say, about the relationship between the human and the environment, uh, environmental uh, activities, uh, has gone through, through uh, fundamental changes in the last five decades. So the, the concept of what is uh, environmentally practical and uh, uh, what is absorbed technologically and economically practical, what is environmentally uh, necessary and politically feasible, is a rapidly changing as a such. So, and so are the whole philosophies regarding the human and the nature relationship. Out of the traditional conflict uh, between the, 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 the classic production and the uh, of classical production economies and the deep ecology, uh, we've seen a successive emergence of the new paradigms that would be named the environmental protection, resource management, and eco-development. And the first major change occurred, in fact, in the beginning of the 60s, when the traditional development of optimism and the idea that the human can dominate the nature was strongly challenged uh, by the several observations that the, uh, of the environmental degradation. And they are well known. I mean, the permanent impairments of the several species of the bird due to the pesticide accumulation uh, and the uh, methyl mercury accumulation in fishes and the, the fishes kills because of the uh, very huge organic discharges and the, the high BOD rate and the and many other I mean a situation like the eutrophication of the rivers and the lakes and the reservoirs which really sent a, a, a huge warning signs and the environmental pollution as such became a widely recognized uh, recognized problem uh, especially after the publication of the a silent spring uh, of the Carson in 1962 and the first uh, the promulgation of the first environmental act uh, of the suite of Sweden. So the the first paradigm of environmental protection focuses very much on the damage control and it sets the limits of the human activities. However the real paradigm of resource management when we, we can find a lot of the countries, many countries falling under that for the first time brings the concepts that we are so much I mean, mentioning in the, the, the last decades, and that's uh, the concept of the uh, resource management, the concept of the sustainable development. And if we see further what the uh, resource management concept is such, or paradigma broad, uh, we'll see that they will try to incorporate the capital resources, capital and resources, so you say somehow to bring them together. So environmental capital, the human capital, <laughs> capital, capital, as well as the money, I mean, uh, which should be brought into the calculation when we account the productivity of, the, uh, of, the, of the, our nations, of the countries, and we somehow the, the, the brings it, bring it into the development uh, policies and the investments plan. There are what are the other principles within the resource management, uh, the, which are important, like the polluter pay principle, which uh, uh, clearly brought uh, an approach, which uh, um, I would say uh, brought more than than uh, a relation between the governments and the the polluters. Uh, it brought a, kind of the, uh, for the first time it valued the social uh, price of the pollution as such, and in we. We would like just to see what's happening when, when going uh, through this paradigm. We'll see that the, uh, the problem is with the man, with the human, how the human behave, uh, um, I mean, contra the environment. So in a classical production economies, we, we have the completely, when you, the humans will strive to dominate nature and such. And later on, in, in an early, I would say, uh, 70s, uh, when the environmental protection came as in a good paradigm, but human and nature still have been living separated. However, they have been involved in several concerns uh, for the environment. So the environmental damages have been have been completely 
completely uh, accepted. But with the resource management paradigma, when all many of our countries right now um, uh, falls, so it was created an interdependence, I would say, uh, of the human and the nature. And uh, at the development, it's still not in a straddle, but humans and nature will have to co develop, I mean, as in a kind of a very sophisticated symbiosis as such. If we see what's happening on <coughs> environmental protection, and I see that many Balkan countries are very much within this concept, is that we act at the end of the pipe. So we do business as usual, but just put a clear filter on the, on, at the end of the pipe and that's all. Then we, we, we are done. So ethically, we feel uh, much, 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 more, much better. So in this situation, uh, I want to just to bring you several uh, a case, let me say, from my country. And uh, let me just show you that particular case, and then we go a little bit back to see how that. <coughs> OK. So this is also seen from a satellite. And uh, you will have it's a very small country, country 10,000 kilometers square of and about 2 million, less than 2 million inhabitants living. So very heavily or densely populated. But in this picture, I mean, you, you see the places when we do have uh, huge lignite resources. We are something like a Kuwait of lignite. Uh, so in this situation, uh, our well of 14 billion tons of lignite is seen as a, a very good chance for the prospects of our economy. However, if we see the small country and we add the, the buildings, the villages, then we will get this situation. So the very first challenge would be how we can accommodate our big businesses, how we can accommodate our huge thermal power stations, which the, the government and such aims to bring over. Uh, because obviously there is no space, or if we want to see this picture more closely, then, then uh, this is uh, our, our river, river network when we see that uh, entirely in a big part we have only a small tributary passing the 40 kilometers and that's the only resort, source of, for the waters. However, we come closer and see what's happening with our, one of the, our open cast mines of the league night. Then we will see that, uh, that uh, the situation becomes uh, very so, and the, this uh, surface of 1,050 kilometers square, as such, uh, when we have uh, 138 settlements and uh, about 75,000 businesses, so uh, we, when uh, 520,000 inhabitants are living, or or when we have a huge density of 500 square kilometers, is in fact our future in this energy sector, the future of our economy, because we still, our, our economic planners say that we have a bright future. Yes, we are not doing well at the moment. We have 40% of the unemployment rate. We have a, uh, huge, uh, huge problems with uh, poverty. However, we are a wealthy nation, because we got 14 billion tons of them. But in this situation, how you can develop the, the sector as a such, and this is the more narrow picture of it, when to say just under the chimneys of the existing thermal power stations, and there are two existing thermal power stations, we will have a 24 um, small villages when the people resides. And in order just to see it better, we'll see that we have a 700 people living in one kilometer square just under the chimneys and very close to the very huge lignite pits and, and open cast mining. And this is so close to our to our, our principal town, to, 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 to Pristina. It's almost almost there. And there are a few more pictures of how that looks from a satellite. And uh, this is the good thermal power station, the good one, because we have the older one, uh, which, which are still in, in production. And this is how we look in open cast mine. And this is not the moon. The Pristina is just behind here. This is just, I mean, at three kilometers from the principal. So and let me go back a little bit now to, 
to analyze in this situation. Uh, this situation, first of all, we have had a, a situation when the new thermal power station is needed. Really, the situation, the energetic situation in the country is not no. so good, and we need really to, to go for a more, more, uh, for more uh, generation of capacity. And what was said, the way how the government communicated, because the government was the one to bring the private investors from, from abroad, and the way how they communicated, they said that the Kosovo would benefit 150 million euros a year if we install 200. Uh, 2,100 megawatts of the new, new, new thermal power capacity. <coughs> and we will, we will benefit a lot. The royal fees will be 48 million. See, corporate profit tax will be 10 million and so on. So you will see that everything was calculated and yearly that would bring 150 million to, to Kosovo. However, another story, uh, another, another study, which uh, recently, uh, uh, a year and a half ago, I mean, came from the World Bank, shows that the the price of externalities in Kosovo, just yearly prices are 220 million. So yes, we will gain 150 million. However, if we want to really care about the externalities, we need to invest 220 million to diminish somehow the the, 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 the negative effect effects of the of uh, the huge thermal power systems which are which are in place. So. Uh, this is one of the segments, and uh, what I would like just to, to, to say here that uh, the situation varies a lot across the, in different countries, across the countries. And uh, for a small country like Kosovo, which is absolutely uh, rich in minerals, in mineral ore, in, in, in metal ores, and you have heard maybe about the Trecha Company, and uh, you have heard about the nickel huge capacities, and so on. So, and in such a small countries, well, we uh, are very much limited uh, to the future, let me say, of the big development projects because the country is uh, too small to really uh, absorb the entire capacity. It has no uh, uh, environmental capacity to absorb all the, the negative effects that might come. The population, uh, I mean, is, is very densely uh, there. Uh, available water resources are very scarce. We will have the half of the country with only one tributary going on for 40 kilometers. And on the left and the right bank of that tributary, we will have the 90% the of our, our uh, mineral extraction capacities uh, situated. So, in addition, in addition to the physical constraints, I mean, we will have the uh, development problems, development issues. One of the, the main is the actual economic situation. And maybe this diagram would show in the best way what does it mean for a small country when it, 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 it uh, intends to, uh, to make a huge investments on uh, mineral exploitation. So that uh, you will see that uh, this, uh, this uh, Gaussian curve, distribution curve, the fact that the Kosovo with its uh, more than 2,000 uh, euros per capita GDP is exactly in this moment comes at the peak uh, of the of the of the pollution uh, as a such, and uh, it just says that the countries like Kosovo are with the two or three thousand GDP per capita enough rich to get into the adventure of building a huge capacities. However, they are poor enough to do it by side, to really do it in a way that will bring a lot of the control abatement, uh, let's say, um, and control, uh, environmental control, or, or pollution control, uh, pollution control uh, equipment. Uh, so I, I assume that uh, uh, my 10 minutes are over. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to leave it from here, but still, uh, I mean, since we will have some time at the end for questions, I would be very happy to answer all those that I can. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
I'm sorry, I'm not of the list now, but I see something interesting here. I want your. What does it mean? Who knows what this one means? GDP. Please raise your hand. GDP. How many people know what GDP means? Not so many economists around. Gross domestic pollution. <laughs> Until we don't change. <laughs> so our speakers list in the next order to come. Now we have uh, the presence of uh, two ambassadors coming from two different countries. Both of them excellent speakers. I had already the luck to listen to them in different occasions. And these countries are so different one from the other one, but with a common message today. We will speak about, we will have uh, the ambassador of India, so a country with a very strong development, ongoing, uh, over one million people and uh, more or less probably. Mm -hmm. More than that, I apologize. <laughs> Yes. And then we will have uh, the ambassador of Denmark uh, with the uh, consolidated uh, economy and with always a very strong attention on the environment and environmental policies. May I please welcome uh, Mr. Yaoui Shan Kaguta, Your Excellency, Ambassador of Denmark. Let me thank all the distinguished audience representing various walks of life from politics to economy to <laughs> academics. And I would like to thank the Dean Chamber for organizing this wonderful <laughs> presentation today, and particularly to Michelle for uh, inviting me to this, speak on this occasion. And I, before I start, I would like to mention that I'm speaking this in my personal capacity and not as a representing government of India. So now let us start, but we should understand what is, uh, uh, what do we mean by development first? Mm -hmm. So I want to define what do we mean by development. Adam Smith was one of the economists who started this concept called Wealth of Nations. And then uh, uh, the whole concept of GDP came from there. Then we had the Industrial Revolution. Large scale production machines were created and small industries were considered uh, very inefficient and uh, not very productive, not very innovative. So we bought this, pro this concept called Gross Domestic Product, which we were just talking about it. So the whole process of development today is measured in terms of gross domestic product. You read any newspaper, you read Economist, you read Financial Times, you read Wall Street Journal, everywhere there will be statistics of GDP growth in every country, every quarter, every organization even, measures the growth in, in terms of GDP. And then you percolate down it to the population, you call it per capita income, dividing the population with the, uh, the GDP divided by the population. So every country is aspiring to have more GDP and more per capita income. That is the race we are in. Now that race means that we have to have more production and more consumption. It's a very simple answer. Because without more production, more consumption, you cannot have more GDP. And the quality of production and the quality of consumption is immaterial in, in terms of GDP calculation. Because if you produce arms of $10 billion, that means 10 million GDP. If you produce milk of 200 million dollars, that means 200 million worth of GDP. So if the GDP is blind to the quality of production, whether you produce drugs, whether you produce arms, whether you produce alcohol, whether you produce
to his will, they are all equal in terms of duty. Then this also means that we have to consume more and more natural resources. We have to exploit the mother earth, a lot of minerals we need. We have to cut a lot of trees. We need a lot of river water. We have to take a lot of water from lakes. And we have to also uh, use a lot of uh, fresh air to, to continue our production. So these are the uh, requirements of higher GDP which we are following. Now, as a result of this process, there are many things which have happened. The one is that the large scale production units have come up. Because the small scale production units are no more competitive, they cannot sustain themselves in the market. Their financial uh, capability, their marketing capability do not allow that to happen. And the second one is that uh, these new innovations are taking place one after another. The innovations, this big mad race for innovations because you have to be competitive in the market. So every company comes out with innovations, with new marketing strategies, with new kinds of uh, very attractive advertisements. All of these things are in, in the post. As a result, we are also having great urbanization because rural industries have been destroyed. They cannot sustain migrating to the cities. And then we have, of course, slums in the city. I will talk about that a little later. But this is what we understand by development today. I think you, by and large, this is what we understand. <laughs> UNDP has come out with a new index called human development. But they have just made some marginal changes in that in terms of education and in terms of health requirement. But by and large, 90% of that concept is still depends on gross per capita income or gross domestic income. Now the question is that this kind of model, where we are striving for more consumption every day, more production every day, more resources from the nature, <coughs> and if so, for how long? Now this is what the question is. Now let us see what is the environment. What do we mean by environment? According to ancient Indian writings, the environment consists of five elements. Okay? And they are in this order, the space, which is available without space, nothing can exist in this universe. If we are here, it's only because of space. The second is the air, all airs, whether it is carbon dioxide or oxygen or helium, any other air, they are all constituting, constituting the second part of the environment and air. The third part is the fire. Now, fire is the, the sun is the visible symbol of fire, but fire means basically energy. All energy which exists in the universe is the fire. The fourth element of uh, uh, environment is water, which we know, and the water cycle, how the water converts into air vapor and clouds and travels millions of kilometers and then again comes back in terms of snow and rain and then refills our rivers and lakes and, and the groundwater and all that. And that the four, fifth element is Mother Earth with all its mineral resources and plants and vegetables. So this is the definition of environment. I think everything which consists in this universe is made of these five elements. Now, if we look at our own origin, how do we originate it? You originate it from a drop of semen. Now, drop of semen comes from where? From the food we eat. That converts into semen. So our origin, our conception lies in, in, in food. And then we eat food every day, which converts into our body. It converts into Flesh, blood, bones, and whatever we have to do. So the food becomes our body. Then we need water, we need fresh air. All this comes from where? From these five elements which are talking about. The energy as well, the, the, the cosmic energy. So all these elements sustain us on day to day basis. They give us birth and then they sustain us on day to day basis. Body, the water becomes body, the air becomes body. Now, this concept that we have to coexist is not a right concept. It is our mother. It will exist whether we exist or not. There is no coexistence. It is our existence which is at stake, you see. Not nature's existence. If everybody dies in this universe, nature will still survive. But if the nature dies, we cannot survive even for a day. So it is not a question of coexistence as we keep talking about. It is the question of existence of humanity. 
Now this actually we are connected with the nature in other way as well. That food is one element, but if you look at our five senses, why do we have five senses? Why do we have only five fingers in the in our hands? There are reasons behind it because each of our senses is connected to the nature directly. The sense of hearing is connected with space. The sense of touch is connected to air. The sense of sight is connected with fire. Like when the sun goes down, you can't see anything. The sense of taste is connected to water, and the sense of smell is connected to the earth. And this is the direct connection we have, each one of us has, with the nature, mother nature. And plus, the breath we take <coughs> connects us directly to the entire universe. As soon as we stop that breath, our body doesn't exist anymore. So we are directly connected to the mother nature. Now we have to see, since in the last hundred years, I think our uh, exploitation of mother earth, mother nature, has been more than what has been in the last 5,000 years. It is a proven fact historically. So we have to see how much uh, more we want to exploit the mother nature and how long we can sustain it. The consequences of development, let us also have a look at that. Today, as there was some of the previous speakers were talking about, because of this large scale production, big industry units, urbanization, we have 1% population which owns 40% global assets today. Three richest individuals in the world own more than the combined wealth of 48 nations. We were talking about Walmart, so this is also the fact. Then combined wealth of 10 million millionaires was 41 trillion in 2008. It could be much more today. Eh? And there is no actually shortage of wealth. Because since the, in, in the last 60 years, the wealth of the nations has gone up at least by 200 times, while population has gone up not more than twice. Still, we have more poverty today than we had 50, 60 years ago. Because of distributive injustice as they call in economics. Now, employment is on the rise because machines are replacing people. Despite such a great, uh, increase in production, we have decreasing employment. Every time we have problem of unemployment everywhere, so many new jobs are needed. Then we have poverty which is on increase, malnutrition is on increase. Uh, we have uh, millions of tons of food which is wasted on the other hand. On the other hand, we have millions of people who are starving. You go to a five star hotel, how much waste is done and how much people are living on the streets, and you can see yourself. Now we have these urban slums. 18, in, in 1800, only 33% world's population lived in the cities. Today it's over 55%. And you go and see cities like Delhi, Mumbai, Sao Paulo, I'm sure Mexico City. I've seen some of them. You would be shocked to see those slums. The people are living in subhuman conditions in the cities. And naturally they resort to crime. They uh, are dehumanized. The children are not educated, there's no proper education. This is the result of uh, uh, development I'm talking about. And if you go to a big industrial unit, go to any big industrial unit, you will find the human being like you and me are working as robots in flesh and blood. They are only putting one thing like this eight hours a day. What mentally, mental faculties can they have after that kind of work? So they want to go and drink after the work. So this is what we have created because of these large scale assembly line units which are everywhere in the world. So capacity of mind and thinking is decreasing gradually. Now we talk about economy, uh, the climate change and ecosystem. I think these facts are known to all of you. How much damage has been done? Industrial activities of modern civilization has raised atmospheric carbon dioxide level from 280 ppm to 379 ppm in the last 150 years. And my predecessor, he was showing the photographs of pollution in his own country, how much pollution we have created because of so-called economic development. And we have spoiled rivers, we have spoiled lakes. I've seen many lakes completely dried up. Rivers have been turned into chemicals and fertility of soil and quality of soil is decreasing slowly, slowly. Now these are the facts which I don't have to reiterate because 
all of you know all these facts about the, uh, the climate change that is happening in the world. <coughs> we are also having more health problems because of this development, because people are very much stressed. They need to replace cell phone every six months, car every two months, and this thing every two months because of this so-called uh, you know, marketing and innovation every, every two years. When we have food and water, they no time to eat or drink. They have to go to a small little fast food place and eat and take a bite and, and take their breakfast and drive their car. So that kind of stress level and food habit. And we have these fast food, GM food, preservatives, which are everywhere in our life, which is reducing, posing a health hazard. In fact, these hazards will be realized by the humanity, not now, but a generation or two later, when you will not be even able to produce a child. Because the sperm count in many parts of the world has already gone down considerably. And you will have lost your immunity against many diseases afterwards. Now these are life, lifestyle changes, automation, addiction. Addiction to alcoholism is increasing. If you go to a country more developed, you will find more alcoholism, more smoking, more antidepressant tablets and things like that. So chemical content in the body are increasing. I have constraints of time, so I won't proceed very, I will just proceed very fast. Now, we are also having these social conflicts because of this disparity of income, glaring disparity of wealth, and you see that there's social unrest in many countries, and you have the intolerance and violence and even terrorism. So is this kind of thing is sustainable? We have to think ourselves, we have to ask these questions. Now, my question is one very simple. You are all Economist, if there are two units producing X amount of output, one is using Y input, another is using Y, y minus one input, which is more efficient? The second one will be more efficient because it is needing less input to produce the same amount of output. This is the economic <coughs> principle, everybody would agree to that. So, a person who consumes less from the nature. He is more enlightened than the person who is always greedy and looking for more and more and is still not satisfied. This is the concept we have to evolve. We have to consume less. We have to live more simple lifestyle, more austere lifestyle, rather than having this madness for uh, desires which are infinite and which can never lead you to real happiness. This is the illusion of happiness which we are following through this higher consumption and better products and this is not going to lead us, it's going to lead us only to more stress, more diseases and more problems. So I would like to end this presentation saying that there's no harm in having more Gandhis and more Mother Teresa and more Mandela. They are simple lifestyle. I think the earth could be much better off. We, they don't need a lot of people who are all the time mad after consumption and mad after more production. <coughs> now, I would like to end this presentation with one Sanskrit sloka which reads like this I am Nij Paroveti Ganna Lagu Chetsam Udar Charita Nam Tu Vasudeva Kutumbuta. That this is mine, this is yours. This kind of thinking is for those who have very mean mentality. Udar Charita the people who have enlightened thinking, for them the entire mother Vasudeva Kutumbutam, entire earth is one single family. And this environmental disaster must make us feel that we are one single family. Because this is not going to uh, escape us, or this is not going to provide us any escape irrespective of political boundary or irrespective of any other boundary. The disasters can happen anywhere, anytime, all of us in the family. So thank you very much for your attention. Excellency Mr. Tom Noring, Ambassador, I think in this case Ambassador <laughs> of Denmark. <laughs>
this case, in the past, there was a slightly uh, uh, sore throat, which you know, was better than it was yesterday, and I couldn't speak at all. Probably <laughs> would have been better for everybody here <laughs> at the same time. Uh, I think it was not only the, uh, I mean, the ambassador and the private person, but the philosopher uh, that we found in, in our my uh, Indian colleagues' uh, introduction here to, to the subject. Uh, very, very interesting and very enlightening and focusing on one thing for sure. We need to spend less resources in order to produce a happy life. I would point it out to. Uh, unfortunately, we are where we are. We are facing enormous global challenges with climate changes and pollution, as we've heard. I think in both speeches, although one focusing only on a small country, the other focusing on Mother Earth. Uh, I wish we could have done like uh, the Indian ambassador said and thought as one family, uh, but, but uh, if that one family is the United Nations and the efforts within the United Nations uh, to deal with, to tackle the climate change challenges that we are facing, we are doing very, very bad as a family. Uh, Denmark as a country, uh, the Danish government at the time, the Danish parliament, had very, very high hopes when we decided to host the COP15 a few years ago. Uh, where we hoped that we could reach a global agreement on how to tackle exactly the problem that we're facing with climate change. Um, at that time, I was the ambassador in Greece. I talked a lot about it. I went out to speak to, to universities and, and conferences like this. And I always talked about my children uh, and the hopes that I had for their future. And my my conclusion was almost always that if we don't reach a, a good result in Copenhagen, that was in 2009, then I don't know if my advice to my children would be to have children themselves, because what kind of future are they really going to bring the, the, those children? Uh, now, a few years later, uh, my kids are, my daughters are 20 and 22, and I really don't think they should have kids. And it's not because I don't want them to have sex. I just don't want to have children for the future if things are going the way they are right now. Uh, I mean, this this is really uh, uh, serious, although I'm, I'm making a little bit of a joke about it, because what, what is it that we're doing? We're really trying to plan for the future. We're trying to look at the planet which is going to be there no matter what. The question is whether it's going to be livable for those creatures that we are. And then we are really running a risk that it's not going to be a livable place for the future if we don't care and take care of our planet. Uh, unfortunately, since COP15 in Copenhagen, it hasn't gone any way further in the right direction. So I think I don't, can't even talk about the word development in this case, because there's no development. It's sliding back uh, in terms of reaching results that could pave the way for the future at the international scale. <coughs> He simply cannot afford to continue that way. Uh, now, we are in the European, uh, the EU Chamber of Commerce here, so I will take a little time looking at the EU side, uh, because I do think that the EU has done remarkably uh, in terms of political decisions uh, over the last uh, few years. Uh, we have been very brave, we have been in the forefront, we have been trying to push the issues uh, and we have gone so far as to decide within the EU to go a lot further than what we are demanding of the rest of the world. Uh, very shortly, I think most of you may know uh, uh, the 2020-20 ambitions, that is by the year 2020, <coughs> we will have reduced, as ambition, I think we will reach that goal, I hope we will reach that goal, reduce the CO2 emissions by 20%. Uh, based on the 1990 levels, that we will have increased renewable energy sources by 20%, and that we will have increased energy efficiency, energy savings by 20%. Uh, that is the goal. Uh, it's even further when we talk about, uh, uh, thank you for increasing my uh, <laughs> volume here, and that helps. Uh, 
when we go a little further to 2015, uh, to 2050, the goals are even more. Uh, I'm, it's not been easy to have these negotiations, with, negotiations within the EU, uh, especially during a financial crisis. I will come back to that a couple of times, I think. Uh, it's been hard to get all member states on board to understand that despite the crisis is the only way ahead. The argument often is, well, we also have to be competitive and we cannot survive in this world with the new strong economies, the emerging economies racing so far ahead of us, we are losing ground, so please don't also ask us to think green and be environmentally friendly and, and climate friendly because then we're really going to lose this global battle. Uh, I'm happy to say that we are still uh, sticking to the 2020 ambitions uh, and, and I think, I hope that, that we will continue to do that within the European Union. Uh, as for my own country, we have tried to be a front runner for many years uh, and just when, in regards to, to the, the goals here, we are actually uh, it, I, I should say the EU goals are the common goals for the EU, but every country individually has its own goals. Some are less demanding than others based on the actual uh, development level at the time when we made the decisions. I mean, we're not into a game of everybody reaching the same achievements when we have a, a different starting point. Uh, Denmark actually had already done quite a lot, and we need to do a lot more than others at this stage. Uh, but we're glad to do that. Our own ambition is, for instance, that Denmark will be fossil free by 2050. I can also tell you that the ambition of my capital, Copenhagen, is that they will be this, the first CO2 neutral capital in the world in year 2025. That's not too long from now. Uh, we really hope that this is going to work. The big question being asked often within the EU and outside is, is it economically viable at this stage? I already mentioned that. And, and for sure, uh, that is our own, my own country's uh, um, experience. It is viable. Uh, we had, for the last 25 years, in total, an economic growth of 70%, not 17, 70, 70, with zero growth in our uh, energy consumption. That means that we have been able to have a productive economy over those 25 years, reaching that level without increasing our energy consumption. So that means we can do what you were asking exactly. I mean, use less to get the same. It is possible. Uh, but we have to deal with some uh, stereotypes in, in our discussions. Um, what happened, what brought Denmark, little, uh, little Denmark, it's not as small as Kosovo, but it's very close, we're only 5 million people. What brought us to this kind of green thinking? Uh, well, it was actually something uh, that more or less looks like the situation today, economic crisis, financial crisis. That was really hurting, but it was not now, it was in the beginning of the 70s, 72, 73, when we had the oil crisis. And that was really an eye-opener for the Danish people, for the Danish politicians, whether they were in government or in opposition, for the Danish NGOs, civil society in general, and for the Danish business environment. And I don't know if it was a religious revelation or, or whatever it was, but they all seemed to come together that seldom happens in real life. But they actually almost seem to come together at the same time with the same uh, realization that we need to do something about our energy consumption. We need to do it for the environment, but we also need to do it for our economy. And slowly out of that grew, yes, legislation governed by the parliamentarians and the government. Uh, a lot of initiatives were taken by the government at the time and by the parliament. The funny thing was that they were actually looking eye to eye on these issues. Uh, think about that in Hungary, for instance. Eye to eye, opposition and government at the same time, it's, it's sometimes almost an illusion. But it did work at the time. But even more importantly was that the people were following the same path. 
And when we talk about this issue today in this gathering, also very, very important was that the private sector, the businesses, were following through very fast. Um, let me give you one little example. I know that somebody from Grundfos, a Danish company, is going to speak later on. And I don't know if I'm stealing her story, but, but I, I, I hope not. But Grundfos is a, is a Danish company, that's, company that today is well known for clean technology, uh, green uh, eco companies, an eco company, or whatever you want to call it. They were not an eco company back in the 70s. They were a big industry company. They were doing industrial production. But the crisis at the time led Grundfos to realizing that they really needed to do something about their own production to lower the uh, amount of resources, to reduce the resources uh, for their production. From that flew, uh, so was, was kind of a flow to a thinking later on that actually not only should we save on our own resources, but why not make sure that the products that we're producing are also eco-friendly, that they're also consuming less energy than they were before. And I think, at least that's how I read it, and I've heard the story a few times, how, how I see the picture, and it's, it's quite a nice way of thinking. It's a smart way of thinking. It, it's not about a matter of just thinking green. It's not just a matter of doing the right thing because we have to, because we're politically, uh, idealistically uh, uh, so inclined. In, in terms of business, it makes good sense. It's actually a product that now is selling quite well. I'm happy to say that just that company has four, or almost very soon four, uh, production plants here in Hungary. Uh, when we look at business, we can legislate very strongly for what they should do and how they should be environmentally aware and friendly and conscious. Uh, and that is important. I mean, the governments do have a, a strong role to play in legislating. But even more important is what the companies themselves are doing. And if we look at the results in the business, uh, on the business side, in terms of uh, um, pollution and reducing CO2 emissions over the last couple of decades, I think we will find that many of the achievements, and they are big achievements in many countries, I have to say, these achievements are not so much due to strong legislation, but due to voluntary uh, efforts by the companies themselves. Uh, another time,
very much. It is really a pleasure to be here and to have such a distinguished panel. And I'm going to be introducing, but before I do, I would like to challenge a little bit the audiences and the panel as well. The reason I'm challenging because I know one successful work where the business and the legislation go together and they made the difference and it changed the world is the Montreal Protocol. So we have during the past decades reduced the ozone depleting substances by 93%. And I think it would have worked if business the refrigerator manufacturers, the, the legislation, the companies, the, the people, the consumers wouldn't have gotten together. We will still have the ozone depletion that we were facing. And is the world getting better? Yes. Can we do it? Yes, we can. The way whether the panelists how they see it. So we have a distinguished panel here, and I'm very happy to introduce the lady first, Kathleen Urban, who is CSR, head of uh, Groom Foss, and you have quite a substantial experience in a business that is facing engineering and a lot of industrial background. Over the past, uh, past years, also working on sustainability sustainability reporting, communications, and my question comes uh, as to all the other uh, distinguished panelists, uh, what do you think might be the importance of a perspective in that respect? So what can a business do? Can a business do anything? about it. Is there a problem? Is there a solution? Is there a green solution? It's a very general question. Yes. <laughs> and uh, of course uh, I would say that uh, business can do or should do. And I think what is the most important, all the businesses need to find the, the part where they can do the most. So I don't think that all businesses should add all areas. Because of course it cannot be, um, you cannot uh, made from them that they, they do it on all the areas, but all the businesses can find where they can have the most effect and they should find that and act there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now to Mr. Kokach, I'm, I would like to ask uh, the question, you are the managing director, uh, you started as the managing director of Electrolux and now you are having Central Eastern Europe and you are working with uh, business chambers of commerce both uh, across many countries, sitting on boards of companies. Uh, do you think the greening of the business is happening? Is there any kind of opportunities how we can pick it up and accelerate it? Or there is still a lot of challenges that businesses are facing? Um, of course, the greening of the business is happening. I mean, we have heard about this uh, today quite a lot. And I would go back to uh, whether businesses can do something or not. Of course, businesses can do a lot, but not themselves. Uh, only together, and we have heard that uh, several times today as well, that we have to work together. Politics and businesses and uh, NGOs and the whole of society. And uh, let me give you a, an example from our industry. A refrigerator produced by us 15 years ago, or the other way around, the refrigerator produced today uh, by us uh, consumes 70%, 70% less energy than one produced 15 years ago. Uh, however, if the consumer would not change those refrigerators, then our technological development is more or less in vain. Of course, it's not. Many people uh, change their refrigerators or other uh, household appliances, but we need more and more that, that type of awareness, and uh, here we can do. Uh, the real, or we can achieve the real uh, results all together uh, with the governments and together with our consumers by raising the awareness of uh, consumers. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Uh, Michael Nixon, Managing Director of Nestle. Uh, you are coming from being a biochemist by background, and you have been working with 
companies for the past 30 years to operate. And what do you think would be an important opportunity for an FMCG campus on opportunities in the area of uh, businesses that are resource efficient, that are a little bit greener? Is there something that you think it's important to share with the audience? Thank you for the question. Um, first of all, I think it has to start within your own doors, uh, making sure that you try to cut all growth from resource use. Uh, that's been mentioned now by a number of speakers today. For example, over the last uh, 10 years of Nestle, we've grown 70 percent, almost as, as much as, uh, as, as Denmark have. But in absolute terms, the CO2 emissions, uh, energy and water consumption has been between 10, 10, 10 and 30 percent less. This is the sort of thing I think the whole industry needs to find a way of coupling their growth objectives from their resource utilization. However, the point that's been made about what more can an industry do and how can that be linked to maybe their core competencies, because this is about knowledge transfer, it's not just about financial do do donations. So in the food industry, clearly the food players have got to face the challenge of available water, the challenge of uh, combining of water, energy and food, which is a huge challenge nowadays. We've seen the price of food go up significantly in recent years. as. Uh, uh, energy and food are competing for the same land, causing in some cases things such as deforestation. And I think we have to do our part uh, along the whole value chain to try to improve the availability of food, uh, make sure that water usage is very, very uh, well used. And I can give you an example of that, a knowledge transfer, for example. Uh, cocoa plantations providing uh, species of cocoa plants which are disease-free, which use much less water and allow the productivity for the farmers to earn more money. These are concrete knowledge transfer things right across the value chain that can make a huge difference. Now, if every company plays their part in the area of their expertise, we can make a huge difference to some of the issues and challenges that were mentioned earlier on today. Uh, thank you very much. You have mentioned twice at least in your contribution the area of finance. So I wonder, uh, going to a banker, so I'm very much welcome, Mr. George Lobaronovich, who is the managing director of the uh, K and H Bank. But he, you are also an engineer besides a banker, so you are very near to the issues that were discussed here previously. That how do you see what is the role of a financial institution in actually helping uh, the businesses to go greener or to help? the innovators to help the market to move into a more sustainable direction. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, so first of all, we do not have uh, traditional products and do not make any manufacturing like the other companies. So actually, we are not polluting the air, for example, with our products and manufacturing. But we have a quite large operation. We have 5,000 employees here in Hungary. We have, have 300 buildings. So for us, uh, we have a long-term sustainability strategy, and we are focusing uh, the environmental care. So we have certified now a certified green building, a central building, first such a lead gold certification in Hungary. It's very important. <laughs> so we reduced uh, our energy consumption in 30 percent in the headquarter. We are using green water, for example, uh, and this whole building is quite sophisticated. We would like to extend it to the branches. So this is about our operation. This is our biggest environment. In the environment. Uh, regarding our financial products, of course, we have special products for green investments, building investments. And the reason why we went for a, a legal certificate to our building to show a kind of example for the, for the industry that they should somehow follow this uh, shortly. Uh, thank you very much. I think it will be. Uh, really a fantastic opportunity for businesses to take up uh, the initiative and hopefully that they will do. And last in the panel is Mr. Adriano Ruccini who is an entrepreneur and who is an innovator. So I'm very much looking forward to your business experience of what do you think could be something where we could be looking forward as a guidance 
and and so our lessons learned. Thank you very much. And in fact, I'm uh, trying to innovate. I am innovating all, all my life during my entrepreneurial experience and uh, then uh, uh, working and uh, acting as a uh, advisor, as ambassador, as assessor for uh, EFQM, which is, uh, is an international organization uh, looking uh, for, for excellence but looking for sustainable excellence, which is uh, more important. And which is sharing the uh, It's just just the case. Uh, UHM is also is part of uh, of uh, EFQM, but also companies here on the panel, it's just the case, are also part and, and funding uh, members too of uh, EFQM. Too. So I think this is um, this is important. I'm um, day by day uh, working, trying to uh, to learn, to understand. From different experiences, from uh, uh, in private and in public sector too, because uh, um, what uh, uh, we we have seen that uh, with uh, uh, respect, respect, and uh, with uh, uh, correct use of resources, and uh, with taking example of of uh, who is uh, working in a proper way or who is uh, looking for excellence. Um, it's possible and could be possible to uh, maintain and to sustain our our planet. In fact, it's one of the points we will uh, explain or develop later. We are uh, putting the planet as first equal and profit because profit is important too, but not <coughs> on the first point, but put on a whole point on a balanced or a sustainable point. Uh, the business, which is the business of uh, countries, we have here uh, a lot of representatives of countries and uh, of companies which are part of the countries. Uh, thank you very much. Now, uh, I would like to ask a question that if uh, you are all based in Hungary, what do you think might be an important message for Hungary and uh, for, for the partners in Hungary to actually to promote the greening of the business sector. So what would you need to have to, to do the business? And please take the floor as you, as I can see, you would be the first to, to, to reply to that. Yes, because um, one of my main fields is, um, is to promote growth for certain employer. And it's a very nice and not very difficult task because uh, with the Scandinavian culture, the really people focus and also innovation as uh, I already had a very good brand ambassador here also uh, uh, is uh, very strong in innovation and in Hungary we have very clever people and I think what we could concentrate on is, is to educate innovators or, or companies those people who will uh, make the basics for, for new products, innovative technologies, and we have very good basis for that in Hungary. Yeah, thank you very much. Who would like to come next? I have a mic, so I can be next. I can make her words. I love Hungary. I love Hungarian people in their life. Uh, the opportunities of uh, Hungary. As a personally, as an entrepreneur, and uh, as a developer of uh, EFQM. About the uh, environment, I think that Hungary has uh, incredible opportunities, incredible possibilities uh, about sustain sustainability too. With uh, geothermal, with uh, uh, wind, uh, with uh, uh, sun. A combined, a combined cycles of, of a biomass, biomass for, for example. No, no, no other country has the opportunities that uh, Hungary has, this is my opinion. If you connect this in a, a proper, in a proper model or in a proper, in a proper framework and in a proper connection uh, without, and this is another, another point of uh, also our, our, our mission, vision, is uh, uh, less less bureaucracy, more transparency. 
uh, more and more understanding, more mutual mutual growth and uh, uh, mutual benefit. And so, um, if we act in this way, I think uh, that uh, for Hungary, also on this side, there's very, very big opportunities also for business and for sustainable business. Yes. Uh, okay. Perhaps I could just briefly uh, build on that point uh, and the importance that was mentioned earlier <coughs> about close cooperation between policymakers, private enterprise, and even maybe we also NGOs uh, has proven in many, many places to bring the quickest results. And I think here in Hungary, I've only been here for six months now, and I agree fully there's huge opportunities here, but to uh, to exploit those opportunities as quick as possible, close collaboration and uh, a joint roadmap would certainly be a big, big help. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, well, well I, I think the advice is that we might give here if we are at all uh, entitled or uh, best suited, uh, that would be a question mark whether we are best suited to give advice to general the businesses in Hungary or as well. Uh, but if, if I could give an advice, I would say, well, first of all, environmental industry is a good business, whether it's water treatment or recycling or whatever, that's a good business. Also, to be environmental friendly is good for the companies. Reducing energy means reducing costs and portraying yourself as a, as a good employee or a good uh, corporate citizen and improving your image. But I truly believe that when we are talking about environmental uh, issues or environmental friendliness or environmental fairness, it shouldn't be uh, just a question of money or just a question of good profits or not. And we shouldn't just look at returns. But we should listen also for our And thank you. <laughs> and uh, coming from the banking sector, so Mr. Mr. This is my, this is my, my private. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, coming from the from committee point of view, uh, we used to be a communist country and so many years ago. And we are still in the developing phase. So the mindset of the people is that people like the consumer more because we are still developing. We haven't reached Western European countries. So this is a big hunger for the consumption. And this is, I think, the reason for a situation that it's very difficult to change. So I think we, as these corporates and companies, should offer better solutions to the people. This is our responsibility. And uh, that's a very interesting question, because I, uh, I don't know whether you are aware of that this year is the year of air quality <coughs> in Europe. And there is a lot of activities going around it. And uh, in June, the Green Week in Brussels is going to be focusing on air quality. And they made a survey of Eurobarometer asking the European citizens how they feel during the past 10 years. Did the air quality get better, worse, or it's the same? 56% of the Europeans said it's worse. And that's very interesting because I think it's also important to see how the people perceive what is happening. And, and we know by data that it's getting better and better. And they were asking also the question that are you informed about the air quality in your country? And two of the countries said that they are informed. More than 50%, so 56 was Hungary, and 63% was Finland, which was a big surprise for me. And the question is uh, for the distinguished panel that uh, do you think that your employees, your stakeholders, are they informed about what you are doing and are you promoting it in a way that you educate your consumers, you educate your partners, you involve them in your day to day business or activity? Sure, we, we, we do, because that's, that's one of the uh, uh, pillars of our uh, environmental strategy. One is to produce environmental friendly or low energy consumption products uh, that we call green range. And then uh, the next one is to produce with uh, low energy consumption and low emissions uh, in our factories. And the uh, project that is called Green Spirit. Uh, where we uh, reduced uh, in the last six years energy consumption by around 30%. And the third one, of course, to make the consumers aware 
of uh, the possibilities they have, and, and here I I might another uh, uh, example, and it's just by coincidence that it's about uh, Denmark. It's nothing to do with a person or knowing, of course. Uh, that uh, if we have a, st a statistic that if every family or every household in Europe would use a dishwasher instead of doing their dishes manually, then uh, in a year the water uh, saved in whole Europe would be the total consumption, the total yearly consumption of Denmark, which is not a big country, but and I don't know how much water you consume, but anyway. Um, that I think is a, a striking example, and, and, and if you give those kind of examples to, to the consumers, then I'm sure that they will understand uh, that uh, uh, by using a vitamin-friendly product, uh, they can save a lot for themselves. And so it's a big word to say, to say save the planet for our kids, uh, but for sure we'll give an opportunity to the grandchildren of Ambassador Nori. <laughs> Um, our organization, organization um, using or developing model, are very very proud of uh, what they are doing um, all around the world. Um, I've um, assessed and so I've, um, seen organization all around the world, from uh, from Kenya to Jordan to Kazakhstan, all Europe, uh, and something in the China. Too. Uh, what we uh, um, think is that uh, we need a positive, uh, communica positive communication, a positive press. And uh, what is, um, this is one of the things missing. It's, I think it's very difficult also for companies. And it's very, uh, I think it's very important uh, an event such as such uh, is for promoting or uh, for uh, having an uh, echo so outside, I, I hope, of, of what uh, we are doing. This is one of the points uh, that uh, we see uh, as uh, difficult, difficult, uh, positive, positive, uh, positive information, positive information. That's difficult <coughs> for, camp for companies at all, and this is difficult for organization, I think, for organization too. Because uh, it's uh, more, more, uh, <coughs> Allows to, to sell more, uh, writing about scandals, writing about things uh, or disasters or something similar, not uh, about positive things we are doing. You know, a lot of companies and organizations are doing this. Yeah, so I think what the companies that have green initiatives are proud of it. Yeah. Also, our colleagues are very proud of that. Thank you. <laughs> 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 totally. I mean, my first one. Going back to to how how employees uh, aware of sustainability issues. Actually, it's uh, very interesting because, of course, we also say that employees need to be aware of what we are doing. And since we have 2,000 employees, it's not only the 2,000 employees, but their families as well can also, if they learn a kind of behavior at the workplace, they might do the same at home. And that's already 2,000 families. Um, it's not very easy to make them aware of, of what we are doing. Uh, especially we have about, uh, we have 2,000 employees and uh, 1,500 are shop floor employees, blue collar employees, they have no email account, they have no internet, and so on. So it's a great challenge how to reach them. And it's also interesting that we are in a production world and we also use the FTM model. And uh, uh, it's always said that uh, what you want to manage, you have to measure. So it was a great challenge last, uh, second half of last year when we were doing the strategy for, for uh, this coming three, four years. And of course, we want to raise employee awareness. How do you measure that? And what, what do we mean by awareness? So first, we just have to sit down and decide on what, what do we want them to know? So, it's so many information. Uh, and uh, first, you have to be very strong on deciding what you want them to know and then communicate that. So uh, we published um, a sustainability 
before. And unlike other companies, <laughs> the, the main target group was not our consumers, not the, not the general public. The main uh, target group for the report was our employees. So it was uh, full of their stories, their value commitments, and information directly to, to them. And uh, I, we hope it will work, because we are just trying to measure <laughs> how much they have understood of the report. Thank you very much. And Mr. Nixon. <laughs> Maybe I can just touch on the consumer side because that was mentioned before because I think this is an issue for consumers as well. Is that consumers today are being bombarded with so much information which very often is not joined up. Uh, some talk about CO2 emissions, some talk about water consumption. And one of the challenges that we really have in terms of communication is being able to provide life cycle information for consumers that helps them to make a good judgment, and not only on the purchase, but how to use the purchase in a simple way that's pretty standard. Now, you were helping in a big way on this, and there's lots of trials going on to find the best way of doing it, but I think until we find a simplistic way of doing it, or a, at least an easy to understand way of, of doing it, consume, there's a risk consumers will continue to be confused, and they will not trust the information they're being given, and they are very key players in this whole discussion that we're having today. I still think there's a lot more that we need to do in this area. Yes, uh, thank, uh, Mr. Tokac would like to add something to it. Yeah, I, I just want to reinforce what, what Michael just said uh, with another example. If, if you take a washing machine, for instance, then the price of the washing machines uh, counts only for 32% of the total cost uh, during the life cycle of the product. Maintenance, it's only 3% of, uh, of it. The water consumption is 9%. But then uh, washing powder is 13 something percent uh, of, the, of, the, of the total price during or the total cost during the. Now, the, 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 the consumer, of course, should think about it when, when buys whether buys the cheapest product and then at the end will cost more, or, or buys an environmental friendly modern product. And the total cost uh, of use will be less. And in addition, of course, his soul will be will be put to use the bees as well that you know, she did a good thing for the environment as well. So this is one of the reasons why globally resource efficiency is a very important issue. And that's a, one of the commitments and outcomes of Rio Plus 20. And I think this is also what is uh, part of the EU strategy. Uh, now I'm going to look at Michael and, uh, and uh, uh, ask the question whether we can ask questions from the audiences for, for the panel as well. Is it possible? Because maybe some of you would like to ask a question from the distinguished panelists on Thursday. Oh yes, thank you. So would you introduce yourself? I'm going to give you my and somebody else is going to give a mic. And please introduce yourself and ask the question, and please address it to whom you are asking the question to. Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Subhash. I'm an Indian. I have a question for all of you. Entrepreneurs, electronic works, now by FMC, FMCG. At this scenario, where we are living today, where the greed levels are so high, sense of responsibility is not too strong. Like we just now heard that the uh, government of Kosovo has another pressing situation to handle with. Do you feel these kind of uh, statements are just statements? I mean, that this fashion is work. The second part is, these are smoking Thanks to the clean environment, are it pollutes? So, who would like to start, ladies? A lady and gentlemen. <laughs> Perhaps, and I'll just pick up on the first part of the question, because I think the answer was in your question, as this one about ownership and responsibility. Um, you know, these are, everything we say here are either perhaps problems, um, 
possible solutions, but the reality comes down to putting them in place at the point of use. Uh, strategies are great, but the execution comes down to ownership, and that's a combination of awareness of people, and one of the problems that we have today is that the consequences of this are not seen by people because it's not tomorrow, it's not next week, it might be five years, ten years, it might be grandchildren, it might be children, and getting people to raise their awareness of the sense of urgency is, uh, it is, is a big, big challenge. I can talk that I think the industry has moved a long way in the last five years to ten years. I think governments, and particularly in Europe, have moved a long way in the last five to ten years in understanding urgency starting to put into place the many things that need to happen. But we are, I would say, running out of time, but uh, urgency is something which is really, really key now, uh, and that combined with responsibility can make a huge difference. Without the responsibility, then, uh, then we will potentially start running into significant issues in terms of availability of food, availability of water, the pollution implications that have been mentioned throughout today. Um. I think you're right when you say that uh, quite many companies start to do uh, start to work in CSI and sustainability because it is rather trendy today, and they think that if they don't do it, then they might fall behind. And I always hope that uh, if out of ten companies who have started from just being trendy, do find something uh, advantages, they find a business case behind it, and those two will continue on and maybe be as good role models. So, uh, yes, I think quite many do it because it's very fashionable today. But I also see that there are more and more companies who really find the business case behind it and can act as role models. And, and the industry always works based on role models. If you see that uh, something works in another company, then, then you go for it yourself. And uh, I think that's already very good. <laughs> I think that you missed from the wrong panel because we are here because I think that it is a serious issue, very big issue, that, and we have to find solutions. We should have some that we have to participate in such a meeting. So I think we have to set a positive approach. Myself, personally, I have to be sure that if I can tell you that we are not appears, we take it seriously. It's all issue. And really, I think that there is an issue that we have to handle. But we should ask those who do not participate again. Such such panels and such meetings. Yes, <clears throat> we've also seen that uh, uh, with the message of Mr. Van Rompuy, uh, also Europe uh, is improving uh, uh, fastly for uh, better attention or particular attention on all environment and on, uh, also. Not the moment, but uh, about CSR, I think it was trendy years years ago. In fact, uh, also in, uh, in, uh, in our organization, uh, in our foundation, uh, was in the model of six years ago, I think, and we have passed on. This is also experience and the sharing what uh, what works and uh, uh, analyzing and understanding if, uh, if some something is only trendy or is to be useful. Or could be uh, also an improvement for organization for, or for all organization. The fact we have seen is, uh, uh, that uh, a lot of companies are not using it only as trend, but something important for them because they have understood and they are uh, putting in the act that uh, CSR and the environment and sustainability are very important uh, concepts. And still important to be if we are more. This is one of the reasons for which we are here, I think. Yeah, and of course, there might be companies as well, well which use this environmental friendliness just for, for PR or for promoting their image and uh, they are using slogans. Uh, but I would think now I, I wouldn't be able to enumerate any of those companies. But I very much hope that if there are such companies, and probably they are, uh, then uh, somebody would force them to act uh, properly. Uh, and, and this is when I, when I said that we together we can do something. I mean, government can force them with, uh, with legislation. Um, uh, consumers can force them with, with, with demand. 
uh, or uh, with choosing another producer if uh, they believe about the producer that's not uh, behaving environmentally correctly. Uh, but uh, mo many, many companies, and I'm <coughs> sure I can talk in the name of Electrolux, uh, we are always ahead of legislation with uh, our environmental standards. Of course, we have sustainability policies, we have uh, uh, code of conduct, code of ethics, and, and all those uh, procedures and, and, and policies force us to be always at least one step ahead legislation, which I have to admit that gives us uh, sometimes a lot of headaches in the production, in uh, facility management, in, or in logistics, but we have to do it. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't know whether there is more questions. Yes, uh, Your Excellency, Ambassador Moni. Uh, maybe a comment, actually, since you mentioned uh, the EU and, and uh, what they're doing, combining with Janos, who said that maybe we should force these companies who are not living up to their slogans, uh, one way or the other. Well, there's forcing that is using the stick. There's also using the carrot. And if I combine that with what is happening in the EU right now, the EU has just decided very recently on their new multi-annual budget, that is for the next seven years, and that's a lot of money. And in that budget decision was a decision that one-fifth of the total budget has to be used for climate-related, environmentally-related uh, investments. So, so there's a lot of incentive in that, uh, because it's not just money going back to, to governments in the EU. A lot of that money, if you think about the Hungarian case, uh, goes into the cohesion funds to projects. And that means there will be a very, very large environmental component, climate-related component. And that is a very nice incentive, maybe also to some of those companies that are now not so much aware of what they should be doing. But rather than forcing them to behave correctly, there may be an incentive here to get those companies to behave the companies to behave responsibly. Thank you. Thank you very much. And what is very interesting that at least uh, all the European citizens believe, <laughs> according to the Eurobarometer study, that there is a huge opportunity for the next 30 years in renewable energy. So there is no country in Europe that doesn't believe that that's one of the ways forward for, for the development phase. So uh, I'm looking around the room and uh, Ah, there are two, two questions there. Okay. So, uh, my name is Monica Bruno. I am from Thailand. Sorry for my English. A simple question. Uh, first, I have two questions. First question is for Mr. Janos from Electrolux. And uh, you mentioned your products use uh, less electricity, better quality. But I read a lot of articles that many products have special chips. They are working less years, like was before, for example, refrigerator before worked 20 years, and now it's two, three years, and sometimes it's done, and we couldn't <coughs> And it's also new politics to make products uh, destroyed faster. It's not all ecology at all. And uh, I don't know what is better, so use the less uh, electricity, um, but uh, um, products is shorter life, or use them more electricity, and some products have life 20 years. It's one question, you have time to answer. And I have a second question to you. Uh, so you are, I remember you are from Scandinavia? Yes, or you mentioned that. And I live uh, seven years here, and I work seven years in preparation for many different people from many countries. And I don't see and we care about ecology because every day I fight with people about don't use electricity during the day, don't use a lot of cups, plastic cups, and don't use a lot of paper. No one cares. And especially sorry for Hungarian people also. It's really sorry for that. And I don't think that the future for that we don't even care about that. So sorry for the simple question and my English. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, but I think it gives a very interesting ending to the panelists because it brings them a question from the floor that is very practical. Um, 
honestly, I'm, I'm not aware of any statistics that would uh, underpin what you just said about uh, our uh, appliances. I, I believe that the misunderstanding is coming from the fact that while in the past uh, we used to change uh, less often our uh, household appliances, thanks God, nowadays we are using, uh, we are changing them uh, more often. Not because they go past and they cannot be any longer uh, used uh, within a couple of years, but because we are more and more aware of the savings that we can make if we change energy saving, uh, design, just feeling good. What I said, if you have a new appliance that it's nice, it's, it has a good design, and in addition consumes less energy, then you feel better. And, and I hope that more and more consumers will change. Uh, also, the, the, the statistic, well, I don't know the, what you have mentioned, but the statement that you have made is uh, uh, not in line with, uh, and uh, I would say pretty sad statistics that in Hungary and in Eastern Europe generally, the, uh, the, the average life of a household appliance is 12 years. It should be three, four, five years, like in Switzerland. Uh, because then we really can make advantage of the new technologies that we put in our appliances. We can make advantage about the fact that they are consuming less, uh, less, less and less energy, and they are most, more uh, environmental friendly, and they are to a larger and larger and larger extent uh, uh, recyclable. So I'm not aware of any, or well, at least of our appliances, but not even from our competitors that would uh, go bust in two or three years. I'm sorry. Okay, and you, Katalin, was the other one who was challenged? Uh, if I understood well, your question was how to motivate uh, people to behave uh, in an environmentally friendly way. Yes, that's uh, always a challenge, especially when you have 2,000 employees. And uh, you can use many different motivating tools to do that. And uh, let's, if, if I go with your example, if if they use uh, plastic cups, we gave all the employees uh, uh, metal uh, mugs, and they are only allowed to use those on the shop floor. They are not allowed to use any plastic cups. <laughs> or if you want to motivate them to, to use uh, less water, you can also build in uh, the appliances. Uh, that kind of appliances, they are uh, save water themselves. Because of course you cannot. Uh, build on the motivation of, of 2,000 people. You have to find also the technical ways to do that. But talking about motivation, as a production company, you also have other means, like uh, it's part of their bonus system. If they keep their workplace uh, tidy, if they uh, select the waste to the, uh, according to the rules, then they get their bonus. If they don't do it, they don't get their bonus. So you can always use a combination of different motivation systems. Yes, uh, and last question or comment coming from your Excellency. Maybe a question, maybe a comment. Uh, what I think is that the cycle of innovation in coming out with a better product every two, three years is itself is a cycle which creates tremendous amount of solid waste, tremendous amount of uh, uh, you know replacement of every equipment we have. Every six months you replace your phone, every two years you replace your computer, every three years you replace your refrigerator. It means more production, means you consume more resources from the nature, more solid waste, more consumption of water, more pollution into the air. So I think this cycle, we have to think whether this cycle is going to help us. Uh, it, is, it is good in, in, in the short run, okay, we will reduce consumption of electricity, but that's not the only impact of this. There are many more impacts which have to be taken into account. I think we have to think of reducing our demands, our consumption. We have to think of becoming more austere.
uh, we are inviting mayors, ambassadors, and companies uh, in renewable energy and environment sector, which is will, which will be take place in the smart city of the world, Indiana. You are all kindly invited. And thank you very much, Mikhail, for giving this opportunity. And we are welcoming all of you in Vienna in Offbrook. Thank you very much. Thank you. Today, New Chamber was also hosting another presentation. And uh, there was the launch of the keyboard. It is a, uh, um, it's an iPad. It's a new, completely fresh product, <coughs> but very interesting that is uh, managing costs uh, and enhance efficiency. And you will find uh, just outside uh, a stand of presentation. And uh, because there's weakness <coughs> and cost saving, well, this one is managing the cost. We were speaking a lot about uh, saving water. I would like now to invite you outside uh, to consume some wine and some water with us. And you will have a chance to uh, talk with the guest speaker and uh, with other friends that are present this evening. Thank you to your chat. Thank you, Michael.